Good morning. I'm Amy Bahachek, Secretary Designee of the Department of Workforce Development. As you may know, Governor Evers appointed me to this position in late December, but I came on board to DWD in September as Transition Director to help clear the unemployment insurance claims backlog. We are here today to provide you with an update on the unemployment insurance program and explain how our technological constraints continue to impact our operations and how these issues are directly impacting when eligible claimants receive their benefits. I am joined today by DWD's Chief Information Officer, Naraj Kulkarni, Benefit Supervisor, Adam Nisforek, Program and Policy Analyst, Emily Savard, and Director of Management and Information Services, Pam James. Since the start of the pandemic, UI has paid out over $4.9 billion to approximately 600,000 claimants. This is an incredible testament to the hard work of dedicated DWD employees who are committed to the mission of the Unemployment Insurance Program, which is to provide income to those temporarily unemployed through no fault of their own. In addition to providing economic stability to workers and their families during temporary periods of unemployment, UI benefits help reduce the effect of unemployment on the state's overall economy during times of economic downturn. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic and efforts to slow its spread triggered historic numbers of UI claims in a matter of weeks. Never has the state experienced such an incredible surge in unemployment insurance claims so quickly. During previous economic downturns, claims slowly increased over time. For example, during the Great Recession, Wisconsin's highest weekly regular UI claim total, approximately 195,000 claims, occurred in January 2010, three years after the recession began. It was within just six weeks of COVID-19 when we saw a peak of approximately 321,000 weekly claims in 2020. To further illustrate this point, since March 15th of 2020 through January 16th of 2021, 1.28 million initial claims have been filed in Wisconsin, quadruple the number of initial claims filed in all of 2019. DWD has also received more than 10 million weekly claims. Compare that to only 7.2 million claims that the agency handled in the four year period from 2016 to 2019. In addition to the number of claims, DWD has also experienced a high volume of appeals. Since the start of the pandemic, nearly 51,000 decisions have been appealed, compared to under 17,000 total appeals in 2019. To address the enormous increase in volume since March, between new hires, reassignments, and vendors, DWD has nearly quadrupled our UI personnel resources from 500 to over 1,900 today. Specifically, DWD now has over 500 staff working on adjudication issues alone and has hired additional administrative law judges and hearing office support staff to assist with appeals. Even with the increased staffing, DWD needed to utilize technology in order to get ahead of the demand. In mid-October of 2020, we announced a new partnership with Google. This partnership allowed us to provide an expedited review of UI claims and assist in processing claim payment determinations. Using predictive analytics, Google shortened adjudication decision time making, allowing us to release payments to eligible claimants faster. On December 30th, 2020, DWD reached a workload comparable to seasonal pre-pandemic levels. On that day, we had either resolved or assigned out to an adjudicator all issues that were more than 21 days old, effectively clearing the unemployment insurance backlog. With our increased staff and new tools, we are maintaining our workload at seasonal levels for now. But with the nation's unstable economy and the potential for even more changes at the federal level, we are constantly facing the possibility of falling behind again. To prevent this, we are continually reevaluating our staffing levels, improving our processes, and enhancing our customer service. For example, in December, we began updating the language of both the initial and weekly UI claim applications to use plain language. This effort was designed to make the applications more understandable to all individuals who may apply for UI benefits, 
regardless of their educational background or regional and cultural language differences. We hope by improving the application, we'll prevent many people from ever having to be sent through the adjudication process. Another major issue with our current system is how difficult it is to communicate information. We have an online portal that will indicate to the claimant that they have submitted a claim. However, if there are any questions about the claimant's eligibility or our adjudicators need additional documentation from the claimant to make a decision, as of now, that claimant must either mail or fax in the information. We are in the process of adding a portal interface that will allow claimants to upload documentation and offer online secure messaging. Currently, without this technology yet in place, claimants with the questions must call the UI Benefit Center to schedule an interview time to speak with the benefit specialist. Clearly, this is not efficient. In 2021, these features shouldn't be news. This is pretty standard stuff in most areas of our lives. But with DWD's data technology, it's a big deal and it's a huge lift. While the collaboration with Google and the short-term IT solutions assist claimants and DWD staff alike, they do not constitute a long-term solution. The only path to preventing and preparing for future crises like the one we're working through now is a comprehensive modernization of our IT system. This administration recognized the desperate state of the UI system even before the pandemic hit and had taken the initial steps towards modernization in 2019. We researched what features were out in the market and what it was gonna to cost to get what we needed. At a time with near record low unemployment, DWD thought the greatest challenge was going to be trying to convince enough people that the UI system was important enough to justify the investment. Well, unfortunately, the pandemic hit and hundreds of thousands of people have now experienced our flawed system and way too many of them endured a delay in benefits because of it. Now, as I mentioned, I came to DWD in September. I had heard anecdotally about the antiquated systems, but I have to admit, I truly did not understand what DWD was dealing with until I got here. Now, we work in government, so no one expects the government to have the latest and greatest in any technology, but what DWD has been working with was a complete shock. So today, we want to show you the technology we have uh, as we try to deploy new state and federal programs, as well as to provide customer service to our UI claimants. We hope to show you why we need to start investing in updated technology immediately. As Governor Evers proposed in his recent State of the State address, an initial investment of 5.3 million would allow DWD to move forward with the process now. We also hope to see a full commitment for funding modernization in the state's biennial budget. The actual programming will take three to five years to complete. This initial investment is only the first step so we can begin the formal procurement. As Governor Evers stated, replacing this system will take years and that's why it should have been done sooner, but it's also why we don't have another moment to waste. Ultimately, this is the necessary solution to provide better, faster services to future claimants and improve the UI system's ability to respond to future recessions. So to start, I'm going to ask DWD's Director of IT Services and Chief Information Officer, Niraj Kulkarni, to provide a little background on the existing technology and how it has impacted our ability to onboard the new federal programs and prevented us from further expanding our help center hours. Then a team from our unemployment division will walk through the process of adjudicating a very standard claim to demonstrate the inefficiencies in their day-to-day -day operations. Thank you. Niraj? Thank you, Amy. Good morning and hello. Today's presentation will consist of a walkthrough of the steps our staff must take to process a common unemployment claim issue using our outdated unemployment insurance benefit system. But first, I would like to provide a brief, brief overview of the UI benefit system. Wisconsin's UI benefit system is comprised of two internal facing systems, the core benefit system and the appeal system, and an external facing web-based online claim portal used by claimants to file claims and check their claim status. 
the hardware the UI core benefit system and the appeal system runs on is IBM Z14 mainframe hardware maintained by Department of Administration. And it resides in the state data center in Madison. While this hardware is modern, provisioned in 2017, the programming running on that hardware, which makes up the UI benefit system, was developed in the early 1970s. The system was developed using a series of mainframe based terminal screens, a customer information control system, CICS transaction server, COBOL programming language, and job control language, JCL batch jobs. The core benefit system consists of five subsystems, initial claims, monetary, continued claims, check writing, and disputed claims. The appeal system does not have any distinct subsystems. The UI benefit system's massive code base, which is comprised of roughly 8.6 million lines of code, has been modified, updated, and extended numerous times over the last 50 years. The system was developed using the then prevalent software design concepts and approaches of sequential program flow and was not designed to support multiple distinct programs simultaneously. Any modifications and changes to implement new state federal programs have cascading impact on most system components and code within the system. Moreover, even minor changes are cumbersome and time consuming to implement and require extensive quality assurance testing. The five core benefit subsystems and the appeal system are disjointed and siloed, stitched together through data transfers and batch programs. Most data cannot be shared between subsystems. As a result, requiring users to rekey the same information and data into multiple screens within each subsystem, increasing redundancy, introducing errors, and often leading to inconsistent data. The UI benefit system is not designed to use process automation. Therefore, claims processing functions require an inefficient processing workflow consisting of multiple redundant steps and requiring frequent human intervention, which you will see in our demonstration today. The inflexible structure of the system's programs code base also hinders the introduction of most modern means of communication, such as email, document uploads, and self-help mobile-enabled customer service features. Given that the UI program continues to rely heavily on paper documents and paper communications with the claimants and employers. Constraints of the system also prevent simultaneous use of different subsystems. For example, when programs in check writing subsystem are running during the payment processing batch cycle, the screens from the claim subsystem cannot be used as it may lead to data corruption which can result in incorrect payment calculations. This means we must stop taking new calls at the UI help center by 5.30 p.m. each day to make sure calls wrap up by 6 p.m. when check writing begins. Finally, I would like to address COBOL. COBOL programming language was first released in 1959 and is considered a third generation language. Nearly all of today's popular and widely used programming languages, including Java, C, C++, C Sharp, Visual Basic.net, and JavaScript are fourth generation languages. Code written using a fourth generation language typically has half the number of lines of code as the same program written using a third generation language like COBOL. Code developed using fourth generation languages can easily leverage modern software design principles to efficiently implement complex logic and rules. While COBOL requires enormous amounts of lines of code and cumbersome programming logic to implement complex rules. Programmers who know COBOL are hard to find 
and the average age of COBOL programmers is 55 years. DWD had to bring three former employees back from retirement in 2020 to implement the Federal CARES Act programs. COBOL is the 24th in popularity for all programming languages. In comparison, all the top five most popular programming languages are fourth generation languages. Given its age and inflexibility and the continued phasing out of its use, COBOL is rarely taught in schools and universities across the nation. These issues with COBOL have hardly have directly impacted our ability to deploy the new federal programs under the CARES Act and modified extension programs under the Continued Assistance Act as quickly as our counterparts in other states. In addition to everything mentioned here about the UI benefit system, I would also like to note that we have a similarly dated UI tax system. While this is an urgent issue requiring our attention as well, our focus remains on the modernization of the UI benefit system as it most directly impacts claimants, employers, and our state as a whole. Now, I will turn over to Emily Seward, UI program and policy analyst to begin the demonstration. Emily. Thank you. So our hope with today's presentation is to help you understand why we need modernization. If we have a clean claim, an individual can file, have their claim processed, and be paid within a few days. This may happen if, for example, the claimant had one employer in the past 18 months and they were laid off due to lack of work. But we want to show you what happens when there's a fairly simple eligibility issue and bring to your attention how that seemingly simple wrinkles in a case have a large impact on the amount of work that needs to occur behind the scenes. First, I want to state that we have several different systems we need to use and they do not always play well together. We have mainframe, UIBnet, UI forms, suites, Tableau, and the claimant and worker portals. And we often rely on programs like SharePoint or Excel because our systems do not have the ability to do certain things. On the next slide, I'll show you one of our mainframe screens. It's one of over 100 different screens UI staff use to perform our job duties. What you're seeing here is just a part of the list of mainframe screens that we keep on our staff training site. Our staff need to learn the purpose of each screen, how to read the screen, how to input information on the screen, and how to maneuver between the screens. The screens are not intuitive in any way. The screens all look extremely outdated because they are. You manipulate your way from one screen to the next using F keys or by typing as a standalone the screen name. You're not missing much by this being a PowerPoint presentation that shows one screen at a time. This is what it's like working in mainframe. It's one snapshot of information. You're only getting the picture you're seeing here. Throughout this presentation, anytime you see a yellow or green box, that's where we have redacted information for security purposes. To navigate mainframe is to cycle through individual screenshots just like this. You can't customize it. You can't scroll. There's no way to see more information on one page. Mainframe is static. So imagine having a binder and each one of these screens is on a separate page in that binder. You can only look at one page of the binder at a time and you have to look at say 15 different pages throughout that binder in order to do what you need to do on the claim. It takes months or years to become comfortable using these screens and the whole system is like learning a different language. Imagine training someone off the street to use these. Now we're about to walk you through a case. While we're showing you this case, keep in mind how the simple eligibility issue becomes much more complex due to our system. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to John. Less than 18 months ago, John quit his job for a new opportunity. Recently, John was laid off from his current job, so he's filing an unemployment claim. You may wonder, how many of these types of claims do we actually see? The answer is tens of thousands a year. And this is only one of many types of issues that can arise on a claim. 
In this case, John files an initial claim on our claimant portal and reports the quit. That front door looks pretty good to John. Our customer facing system has been worked on for several years and it's a nice curtain for claimants to walk through. But we want to show you what happens behind that curtain, what the staff has to deal with because we have a 50 year old mainframe. After submission, John's initial claim goes through overnight batch processing. During the batch process, a VL issue hold is placed on the mainframe screen BPMQ overnight. VL stands for quit. I don't know what BPMQ stands for. The terms used are not intuitive. Let me touch on the overnight batch process. All transactions done throughout the day are grouped in batches. Those batches are in pending mode during the day until the overnight process is done. By the way, when the batch process is running between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., our staff do not have access to the system. If we had a modernized system, many of these updates would happen immediately. Back to John's quit issue at hand. The issue rejects to our claim staff the next day because John had some work after the quit employment. What does this reject mean? It means somebody has to manually review or touch the claim. We have over a thousand different types of rejects that can occur. So in this case, the reject prompts staff to look into whether John has earned enough wages under the law to be eligible for benefits immediately. If that information is not available in one of our systems, which could be in mainframe, it could be in suites, it could be somewhere in UIBnet, then a letter is generated and mailed to both John and his most recent employer to see whether those wages have been earned. But in our example, neither party has responded, so we cannot say John met requalification under the law, so the issue needs to be sent for adjudication. A quick summary of adjudication. Adjudication is a manual process that requires interested parties to be provided due notice to respond to the eligibility issue. The length of time a case takes to be resolved in an adjudication is dependent on the specific circumstances of the claimant's case. Some cases may take a few days, some may take weeks, depending on the complexity of the issue and how long it takes to receive information back from interested parties. Under normal conditions, adjudication typically takes around 21 days to process. To prepare our issue for adjudication scheduling, John's case must now go to adjudication support. Here, his claim is screened. In this case, adjudication support staff will review mainframe screens. They then merge an issue from the mainframe screen with another app called UI Forms multiple times to generate questionnaires to start the process. And those questionnaires are then saved in UIBnet. This form will go through batch processing and be snail mailed to the parties. For either John or his employer to respond, they need to fax or snail mail the requested information back to us. That response then goes into UIBnet for storage until it can be reviewed. Adjudication support then assigns John's issue to an adjudicator. Support staff need to keep lists to track things like an individual adjudicator's skill level and ability, current caseload and availability to make sure they can take on the issue. If we had a modernized system, this could all be automated. After the case is assigned, John's issue has officially entered the adjudication process. This process requires the adjudicator to attempt to contact all parties to gather information relevant to the case, supply due notice, and offer opportunities for rebuttal before the case can be completed. As the adjudicator in the case, I take statements merging the mainframe system with the UI form system, which then saves the statement in the UI BNET system. I must then choose the type of determination to issue from a list of resolution codes. A tiny set of the resolution codes are for quits are shown here. Did I mention that VL stands for quit? 100 codes are denials. Like I said, it's a different language, not intuitive at all. I've also attached a screen showing various mini formats we may need to add to a determination depending on the situation. There are almost 50 different quit resolution codes and over 500 total resolution codes in our system. For John's case, I will be using a VL 102 which stands for quit, no good cause under the law. I'm now ready to issue my determination for John's case. I won't bore you with the tedium of entering the determination, but want to point out a few things. Entering this determination is a multi-step process. 
Remember at the beginning how I equated the screens to a snapshot and a binder? Now I have to go through multiple screens standalone to convey that information. There's no spell check, there's no word wrap. So I need to be cognizant of typing placement since, for example, if your last word on a line is too long, the system will just break the word in two. And I need to do the math myself to calculate the requalifying amount. See, in this case, $207 per week, weekly benefit rate, need to multiply that by six. I'm grabbing my calculator now. Uh, that would be $1,242. I would need to enter that and remember to add any mini formats that I need. If we had a modernized system, these processes and calculations would be automatic. So after that, I press X and enter to complete the case. I have now issued one legal initial determination on a common straightforward issue. John has been denied unemployment benefits because he quit without good cause and did not yet earn the requalifying amount required to receive benefits. This system will snail mail out the determination letter and update in our system overnight during the, you got it, batch process. And I want to stress, this is just one issue. Many claimants who enter the system have multiple issues on their claim. Issues can also arise at various other times. This is a lot of mainframe maneuvering. Now, I wanna make sure I have your attention because this is a really interesting part. A determination's been issued. At this point, our customer think, I filed, my issue is adjudicated. Why is this not done yet? What's happening? Now we're going to go even deeper behind the curtain to show, due to our system, what else needs to happen after John's determination is issued. I'll now pass the baton to Adam to talk about the adjustment and special programs. All right, thanks, Emily. Before we get back into John's claim, I wanted to briefly introduce what our unit is about. Our role in UI is to do what our system can. Simply put, the system is why our unit exists in its current form. In a year like we had and are on pace to have again, we get a ton of things our system can't handle. Last year, we had a minimum of 250,000 unique case rejects. This doesn't even cover those cases that pop up multiple times, some of them on a weekly basis. This is obviously a huge number. And it has a lot to do with that high unemployment. But even at pre-pandemic times, we average 50 to 100,000 cases a year. So when a new federal program like PUA comes in or PUC, these add layers of complexity, which overwhelm our system's capabilities. To give those massive numbers some context, I wanted to briefly touch on staffing. Pre-pandemic, we ran an experienced team of 16. Now we have 140 full-time staff allocated to this. If you are crunching the numbers with me on the fly here, you'll see that our rejects went up about four to five times and our staffing went up over eight. This is due to that complexity again. When we add federal programs, it bogs down system even further. In each case, it takes longer to process. Additionally, when new staff are brought on, it takes time and experience to be efficient in our system. They just aren't as fast right away at processing these things. Distributing that work, our system also just can't deliver that, can't deliver those items directly to our staff. So instead, our workload comes from a bunch of different reports and lists, and it takes two full-time staff alone just to push that work out to those staff. All right, so now we're gonna pick up kind of where uh, Emily left off with John's claim. Just a bit of a rehash here. So this is a quit decision, a VL 102, and it has several effects. One, it puts the claim on hold. And it also affects not only John and what benefits he might be eligible for, but also the employer and how they are charged. Our system in John's case cannot adjust what benefits have already paid and what will remain paid to him. This then must be manually adjusted via our team. From the employer's perspective, these decisions often relieve the employer from charges. System here also struggles to make those adjustments, causing our team to make those for it. This involves adjusting charges for benefits that may have already paid and also ensuring future charges are correctly applied should John be eligible again. So keep in mind that if you're walking through and manually adjusting John's claim, a modernized system would be able to do these adjustments automatically. All right, so before we can make any adjustments, we need to do a pre-adjustment review. 
If we're gonna make any of these things, we have to make sure the claim is in good shape and ready to handle those. We can't afford to miss something and have, to, and have this claim pop up again and hold things up again. So please note that as we're going through these screens here, uh, while some of these do have some true acronyms with a full spelled out meaning, many of them have no practical translation and just have to be memorized. So we start here on, with FLHS. This is where we check to see the cases processing history. We assign cases each time they reject out. Then we go to dredge. This is one of many reject screens. Um, but it can be very hard to figure out exactly why a claim even rejected out to us. So we always have to check a dredge screen just like that in case to give, uh, so it can give us maybe one more clue as to what needs to be done. Then we head back to BPMQ, um, which is used a lot in this uh, presentation. Uh, this screen is actually one of our home screens. We come back to it, as I said, all the time. This gives us a layout of John's claim and helps us identify our processing plan. And last, but definitely not least, we check out MONI and ESTM. MONI, M-O-N-I, again, one of our, our memorized acronyms here. Uh, these next two screens, they have a really unique relationship. Uh, they are really the core of the person's monetary. That's their weekly benefit rate and their MBA. Uh, An ESTM screen, the one that's up there right now, talks to another program, Suites, and displays the most recent base paid information. This is something Emily alluded to earlier when the two different programs have to talk to each other. So MONI then reads what has on ESTM and becomes the backbone of the claim from the system's perspective. So always have to review that these two screens and make sure that they match. Often our system here has issues relaying this information. And so therefore, before we can make any such adjustments, we need to ensure that this is accurate for the sake of John and the employers who are part of his claim. All right, so we reviewed the claim and now we need to prep the claim. Due to our system limitations, we need to use Microsoft Excel to help us prep our claim for updates. Essentially what we are doing here is taking all the information on mainframe or system and manually entering it into a spreadsheet. So first we go back to BPMQ again. We, this time we change our detail level to one, which is in the upper right. And this gives us our maximized payment information. From here, we copy and paste this directly into Excel, one chunk at a time. In this specific case, it took eight separate chunks to get this all into Excel. Then we go back to Monai. Then here we're grabbing that weekly benefit information in that MBA, MBA information, their maximum benefit amount. This is information we had to verify already via STM a minute ago, so we know it's good. Then we go back to DCIQ, and here we're getting the information we need to make our adjustments. We then find two, uh, we then uh, dive deeper into what the information on DCIQ via what we call the BOMQ screen, where we call it the bomb screen. We put an X on the lid, hit Shift F2, and that gets us to that screen. That's the data we need to copy into Excel. So once we get all that information into Excel, we can now start working down the claim. And here's an image of what that looks like. All right, now we are finally able to start making our adjustments. Where we're gonna start on this claim is a screen called UPER, U-P-E-R. Again, all these nicknames we give us, we, it's, it's necessary in order for us to memorize um, and to help staff learn these new uh, processes. So on to UPER. We can do several things here. One of the main things that we're, I want to highlight on this screen is we need to create a second paying sequence. We need to create a sequence before the quit and after the quit. Uh, so we do that via Uber. We also on this screen are updating the, the person's condition code. A condition code is applied uh, to every single program, whether it's exhausted in the benefit year, after the benefit year, there are numerous codes that we must put to make sure a claim pays properly going forward. So on this screen, we make those adjustments. This one was exhausted. We are now making it not exhausted. So we change that code from an E to a blank. To actually create our second paying sequence, we head down to the lower half of the screen. We put a U underneath the action field, then an asterisk under the pay field, 
And then we copy over this account number, which is a prorate number, a made up number of multiple employers on this on the John's claim here. And then we hit enter X and verify to move on to our next screen. All right, our next screen is called MPRO, M-P-R-O. And here we're actually gonna be making those manipulations. We created our second sequence via Uper. Now we're actually adjusting the money for John's claim. We have to do this twice. The first time, what I did was adjust the money, the MBA benefits paid to John. On the second screen here, this is the second sequence. This is the big one for the employer's perspective because I'm now adjusting their charge and going forward. So they are no longer charged for any benefits that may have paid or will pay in the future. So to do that, we navigate through the several employer accounts. You can't see those here because those are blocked out, but we, we make sure we match those up with our decision. Once we find the one we need to update, we put a U next to that under the U column on the far left side. After that, we go to the issue column and we give it a non-charge code. There are several non-charge codes. In this case, it's a VL. And lastly, we head to the non-charge field on the right and we make sure that is X. That actually applies the non-charge for this employer. After that, we cycle through the rest of the employers and make sure everything is good. Um, and then we head down and X on verify, enter again, and then we are done with that step. So that basically uh, solved two things, but we have one more thing to do. So that adjusted the money and it set up the claim for the future so charges are correct. Now we actually have to go back and fix the charging that already happened and, and charge it to this new uh, number we just created. Uh, so to do that, we go back to DCIR. We hit F5 and this gets us to the DCEA screen. This is where we're gonna set up something called a TOX, a transfer of charges. So to do that, we first have to enter a bunch of information to, to get there. So at the top, we issue uh, issue code of a QE. We put our issue week year in, which matches up with our decision. We put in our adjudicator code. And from a detection code, we put in an O for other. We then hit enter X and F6 to get us down to the bottom half of the, uh, this screen. And there we enter our decision type of 186. Again, that has no real meaning other than it's just what was designated for this process. We put in our adjudicator code again. This is who does the case. And then a resolution code. So you had heard about the VL102. Well, this is a QE210. We then hit enter, X and verify to actually enter our tox. All right, on the tox screen, you we'll see here that we have to put a from and a through period. These are all of the benefits that had previously been paid before we, this quit was adjudicated. Now that we have the decision in hand, we know which benefits need to be charged to our new prorate number, our second sequence that we had created earlier that gives this employer the non-charge. So then looking back at a, a man, man, I, or we're writing it down somewhere separately, we enter that prorate number under the charge column. So once we have that all entered, we hit enter X and verify that again, and we move on to their next screen, which is the TOCI screen, the TOCI screen. And this summarizes all of the, the credits and the charges that we are performing with that tox. All right, we are then ready for our next screen, which is called DCIR. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, system threw a hold on this claim so we can make our critical adjustments. So we, when we're done here with day one, we need to lift this issues uh, held. So to do that, we X on the lid and we hit F12. All right, so now this claim will require some follow-up. The next day, we want to make sure that we, uh, you know, we, we definitely have to follow these things up. We do these for two reasons. One, because we are human. As you just saw, after navigating our system, it would be very easy to miss a step or a keystroke. So we just need to check our work. Also, we do that because sometimes system has hiccups and actions need to be either redone or actually fixed before we can confidently close a case. Processing, processing equipment manually is minimally a two-day process due to overnight processing that is required. 
On a case like this, staff would typically spend 15 to 30 minutes. Special programs, federal extensions, or additional eligible issues would add extra processing days and add numerous minutes to staff processing, processing time. So as Emily alluded to earlier, this is like learning a new language. This isn't something anyone knows coming in from the outside. No one can come in from another job or from schooling and know our unique system. So learning our system language takes a lot of time and to be fluent, it takes even more. That time is something we don't have and teaching staff this stuff is really an exhaustive process. Even after months, most require cheat sheets and must reference manuals to navigate our system. Again, John's case was a relatively simple claim. And in this demonstration, it was really only from the benefits perspective. We haven't even touched on the shortcomings of the system when it comes to our tax area, which in part deals with the financial activities, includes benefits disbursement, employer taxes, and collections. Or also our appeals area, which deals with the next legal step if parties disagree with an initial determination. Bottom line is, this generates a ton of work and slows everything down. With a modernized system, all these processing steps I just went through would be avoided. And for more on modernization, I will now hand it off to Pam. Good morning. Next, I'm going to touch on our IT system modernization progress to date. From 2008 through 2018, UI was taking an incremental approach to modernizing its systems. While UI made progress with this incremental approach to modernization by modernizing the customer facing benefits systems, the pace of modernization with its iterative approach was not sufficient to keep pace with changing business needs, technology changes, and other environmental changes. And the underlying core benefit system, which you just saw, was left untouched. So in 2019, UI took a step back and reassessed this incremental approach in order to accelerate the pace of modernization. UI researched and explored fully integrated vendor solutions to help shape our vision of a future system. In order to do this, UI established high level vendor demonstration requirements to put those vendors through. We based those requirements on a template, a checklist developed by the UI Department of Labor, USDOL, and the National Association of State Workforce Agencies Information Technology Steering Committee. We commonly refer to it as NASWA ITSI. They had developed checklists for states who have modernized their systems to say that when you're done modernizing, you should be able to do this, 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 and this. So we thought what better way to check out these vendors than to say, are they able to do that? So we conducted these vendor demos with five vendors from August of 2019 through October of 2019. We had participation of UI staff from all areas of UI in these demonstrations to provide feedback on the benefits of the products that were pre presented. We also gathered information from NASWA ITSI, and we also gathered information from other states on their experience with these modernization systems. From there, we evaluated the options and began to shape our vision. Next slide. As a result of these demos, UI was able to shape that vision of what a fully modernized integrated system would look like. It would include full integration of benefits, claims and adjudication processes, tax functions and appeal processes. It would also include functionality such as e-communications for claimants and employers and it would also automate many of the manual processes that you just saw. E-communications would notify, notify employers by email or text when information is available for them uh, uh, about their online account. Claimants would receive and send fewer forms via mail and get faster service and online availability to respond to requests online. Ex 
employers would also experience a single integrated system to file their reports, pay taxes, and re respond to requests online. Customer service would be available nearly 24 seven with near real-time processing. So some of the delays that were referenced earlier with batch processing would largely be eliminated. Law and policy changes would be implemented quickly and at low cost. This would be done through use of a rules engine to easily configure system changes rather than make changes in hard-coded system logic. It would, these rule engines can be used for easy update of calculations for benefits and tax. It would include easy updates of special program start and stop dates. Again, not hard coding this in coding language, but easily updated by business um, UI staff users. Questionnaires for fact, fact finding and updates to forms could be made quite easily. Additionally, uh, data is standardized to improve efficiencies in data analysis and federal reporting. And also most importantly, the data would have data definitions in plain language. So as you went through the demo with Adam and all of the references to the codes that are seemingly meaningless, things would be in plain language in these modernized systems. Another beauty of these vendor solutions that we saw that are part of our vision are standardized support functions that could be used across all of UI services, including common workflow, correspondence, and security functions. With regard to the workflow, as Adam referenced, two full-time people assigning work out, work could automatically be flowing and assigned to the adjudicators and other functions in the UI organization. Also, it provides easy navigation for the user as well. Next, uh, the estimated cost of a UI modernization system is based on information that we gathered from USDOL and NASWA ITSI, along with information from other states. DWD assumes a UI combined tax and benefit system upgrade project could cost between 48 and $70 million. These costs do not include interest charges on a master lease nor ongoing annual maintenance costs. These additional costs would bring the total estimate up to around $90 million. Once a purchase agreement is in effect, DWD's annual cost would be determined based on the length of a master lease. Thank you. At this point, I'll turn it back to Amy Pahacek. Thank you. I hope you have seen through the presentation today that IT modernization is the necessary solution to provide better, faster services to future claimants and improve the unemployment system's ability to respond to economic changes that impact the public. We appreciate your time this morning and your support to address the needs of the people of Wisconsin. Thank you.